Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, come. Your love. Your presence comes in. A pain goes out. Your healing comes in. A burdens go out. Your mercy comes in. Your peace all over the world. taught us to pray that it would be on earth as it is in heaven. So Holy Spirit come, let all infirmity be gone by the power of Jesus Christ. May our kingdom come, Holy Spirit come, Holy Spirit Holy Spirit, come. Your love all over the world. Your hope all over the world. Your peace all over the world. everybody ready? Are you, are you relaxed? Yes. Heavenly Father, I ask that you would release yourself upon us. We are exploring the Holy Spirit, somebody who's one with you, a gift from you to us, your very presence within us. And so teach us personally, take over this message, speak to our hearts. In the name of Jesus, may we have an encounter with the third person of the Trinity. Amen. So I'm just going to tell you that the Holy Spirit is one of my favorite parts of Christianity. Um, the Father, when I had no father figure, the Heavenly Father, the God, father of the Bible, became the dad I never had. And, you know, that has some perks. You know, you can lean on dad who owns and runs everything. But dad's also the one who gets a little frustrated when sin happens. And, you know, young men sin. And, you know, it becomes a little bit of a head trip having God as your father. But I definitely enjoyed a deep, in, in relationship with the Father. Jesus, it's kind of fun as, as you walk with the Lord over the decades, he comes in real apparent who he is, and then, you know, you, you, you find him over and over again. And about five years ago, I had the experience of rediscovering Jesus. You know, I know that he's God, but through the scriptures, it became even more evident how prominent his deity is how intricately involved in the salvation story and creation of the world and it just was awed by who Jesus is even though it was the same Jesus I already knew but it was just a greater perspective 
And then the Holy Spirit. Uh, this has been somebody that I received as a young guy before I even had terminology for it, walked with, leaned upon. It's my secret weapon when I'm doing ministry, when I'm preaching, when I'm talking, when I'm by myself, whatever it might be. I'm in constant conversation with the Holy Spirit. Uh, I said it last week. I probably talked to God, the Spirit, more than I, in a day, it's 24 hours, then I talk to any human being. I'm just in constant leaning upon and conversation with. And, and a lot of people see the Spirit of God as an impersonal force. You know, the Spirit of God hovered over the surface of the deep in Genesis 1-2. And, and God said, let there be light. And you feel like a lightning bolt. And, and the Spirit of God was on the move. You, you see that as who the Spirit is. And you can miss out on who the Spirit is by reducing the person of the Trinity to a thing. Okay, you don't have a relationship with a thing. You don't share your feelings with an object. Okay, you don't have a conversation with, you know, an inanimate object or abstract whatever. You know, these interpersonal parts of you connect to a person. Okay, uh, the Jehovah's Witnesses, they don't believe that the Holy Spirit is a trinity. Well, they don't have Jesus right either. So I, I'm, I'm against, you know the theology of the Jehovah's Witnesses, okay? Um, what's the challenge is, is Jesus calls the Spirit, refers to the Spirit as a he. And we would just love to tidy it all up. God the Father, Jesus the Son, and he the Holy Spirit. It would just be a tidy package. Jesus calls the Holy Spirit, refers to the Holy Spirit as a him. And I don't think it means male gender versus female gender. It's nothing like that. But it's God, and we don't get to have that tidy package of husband, wife, and child. It doesn't work like that, okay? Um, and, and I guess I, I want to say that a lot of people struggle with what to do theologically with the Holy Spirit because, um, well... Let's take the Father. The Father, we can relate to a Father figure on earth because we had a Father. And, and the problem is we had a Father and many of us had bad fathers, and that's why there's inclusive language where we take Father out of the Bible because we don't have a good association with the Father figure, and so we don't want to put that association on God. I would like to suggest that we heal the wrong image of the Father rather than change the Father out in inclusive language. Am I making any sense here? And, and so we can see the Father figure. We understand the Son, but the Holy, the Holy Ghost, whoa, okay, that's, that's Halloween-ish, right? That's kind of frightening. We were talking about that at the Wednesday men's conversation, and, and it's, it was, you know, what do you do with the ghost? That's, that's just so weird. And the challenge in the Bible is the terminology used for the Holy Spirit. He's not referred to as Chuck or Tom, or he doesn't have that personal label, Jesus. He's the comforter. He's the helper. He's the advocate, okay, the counselor. And so, that, so there's a little bit of, we identify the Holy Spirit according to his functions. And Jesus says, God is spirit in John chapter 4. When he's identifying God, God is spirit. In other words, he doesn't have 10 toes, 10 fingers, a couple of ears, and a nose. He's, he's a spiritual being, and you and I have souls and spirits that will live on into eternity. Um, so the, the Spirit of God, it's a little bit of a vague terminology that causes people not to have a personal conversation with Him, okay? Now, what makes somebody a person? Well, they have a soul. We see in Matthew 8, 12, 18, 
Uh, Jesus says, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful. Uh, there's another time in, in um, Matthew when God the Father is talking about my beloved son with whom my soul is well pleased. Okay, that's actually Matthew 12, 18. The other one is Jesus in the, in the Garden of Gethsemane. And then there's, a, there's this, so we see the soul of the Father, we see the soul of the Son, and then in Hebrews 10, 38, the Spirit of grace declares, now the just shall live by faith, and if anyone he draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. So what do we see happening here? Who has a soul? The Spirit of grace. We're talking about somebody who's a body, a somebody, a person. And, and a person's soul is made up of mind, will, and emotions. In other words, you have thoughts. You, you get to make choices. You have feelings. Okay? The Spirit comes along and enables us to know the mind of God, helps us to understand the ways of God, helps us to see how God thinks, what He desires, how God feels. Okay? Do, do you see all of a sudden how the Holy Spirit is drawing us into the inner parts of who we are were made in his image. God has feelings. He gets sad. He gets angry. He has emotions. He, you know, some things bring him pleasure. So God has emotions. He thinks things through. Okay. He has a will that he desires. And the Holy Spirit is the same as the Father. They're one in the same and that spirit also has these unique characteristics. You know, God is omniscient. He knows everything, okay? And what's crazy about God is he knows past, present, and future. Um, I had a fascinating conversation with somebody yesterday because there's a powerful movement of the Holy Spirit on their life right now, and they're trying to figure it out, and that day, yesterday, God brought to mind a powerful experience from 2008. And so I'm noticing how God's taking this moment in 2020, coordinating it with 2008. And if this person stays on the journey, it's probably going to see the Lord bringing up other factors where God's been working in your life throughout the totality of your life. He's bringing about your past, present, and future because this is how he sees you. He knows all things. He knows what's best for you. Here's how crazy it is with God. In, in Psalm 147.4, he knows the name of every star in the 94 billion light years of space that we're able to measure. He knows the name of every star. According to Psalm 33, 13, he knows every person on the face of the earth at the same time. And sometimes that would get me, you know, well, how can he know? Well, he's God. He's infinite. We're finite. And how does he know? Well, his spirit is all over the place. Remember, he made this earth. We're this little tiny speck in the midst of 94 billion light years of space that we can measure. And if he's able to make that big thing, he's probably able to be in communication with and awareness with every single one of us. Okay, there's only 8 billion of us on earth right now, right? Give or take a couple hundred thousand, right? So I'm talking about a God that knows how many hairs on our head are counted. I'm talking about a God, the Spirit, who knows the thoughts of the Father, okay? And so and there's this great passage. This is his omniscience. He knows everything. How does he know everything? The Spirit knows the thoughts of God. So we have the omnipotent God. This is the all-powerful God. He's able to do anything and everything. But here's where it's personal and fun for you and me. In Ephesians 3.20, Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. Now this is his own little sermon. The Lord who's able to do exceedingly abundantly more than we could ask or think. Check it out. According to the power that works within us. Now, you're going to notice something. Whenever the word power is connected in the scriptures, guess who it's connected to? The Holy Spirit. 
Okay, remember in Acts 1, you're going to receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. So the power that works within us is what? The Holy Spirit moving through us and, and doing more than we ever thought or imagined. So when you go to prayer and you bring Ephesians 3.20 with you, do you see how suddenly your prayer life is empowered beyond what you could even imagine? I get excited. How does it happen? The power that works within us. And, and, you know, the Holy Spirit's everywhere. In Psalm 139, where can I go from your presence to the heights of heaven, to the depths of the sea? There's no place that you can go that he won't be. Okay? But here's what's amazing about God. He's not just able to be anywhere. He's able to be any when. Something that's been weird for me to figure out is we're connected to our generational history. My grandparents, 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 their DNA, their spiritual nature comes cruising down into me. Remember when God says, you know, I'll take care of business to the third and fourth generations? You know, we like to think <clears throat> I'm an independent person. No, you're part of a legacy, a spiritual legacy. And if it's been a bad legacy and the Lord moves on, you guess what? Boom, you're changing the legacy for the generations that go forward. Your faith will be going forward in your family, through your children, through your grandchildren. And, you know, some of us go, well, but my kids aren't following the Lord right now. You keep praying. I always think it's fascinating that when people get martyred, the cause of Jesus Christ keeps expanding. Why? Because the prayers of the martyrs are being answered. How amazing is that? What does this have to do with the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit is connecting the past generations just like he can reach back to 2008, connect it to 2020, go all the way back to 2000, I mean, 1974, forward to 2038, whatever it is, you got the same spirit of God, timeless, because you're an eternal being connected to God. So here's what there's why all this stuff matters. He knows everything, he's everywhere, he's all powerful. The scripture says the Holy Spirit knows your future, okay? He knows when danger is coming around. He knows when an opportunity is going to be presented to you. And I like to refer to the Holy Spirit as your guide in life, eternal in life now. He's the coordinator of it all. <clears throat> all right? He's the coordinator of your life now and e eternally. Now, this is somebody who knows your path, knows what's coming around the corner. And according to scripture, <clears throat> his job description is to reveal all truth to you. Now, wouldn't you like to know what's coming around the bend? I've got friends that go to psychics. I just got to know what's in the cards for me. I'm like, well, I'm not going to the psychic. I don't want to know what Satan has to say about my future. I'd rather just let God be in charge of my tomorrow. And if I stay in union with him, see, for these people, they want to know what's over there, a destination. You and me, we get to walk with the presence of God, the Holy Spirit, and that is the journey. It doesn't matter where the, the destination is. What's going to happen tomorrow? Who cares? I'm with the Lord Jesus Christ Spirit right now. That's the purpose of life to experience him in the moment, okay? And, and so here's how it becomes really tangible. The helper knows the answer to every problem that you're going to face. The helper prays for you. Uh, Romans 8, 27, he intercedes for us when we don't know how to pray. Talked about this last week. It's God speaking to God on your behalf. Okay, this is crazy, deep, powerful stuff. And, and you know, he guides you. <clears throat> Paul and Silas, they want to go to Asia, which would have been Asia Minor, Turkey. And it says the Holy Spirit did not permit them to do that. 
Was it Jesus who said no? Was it the Father who said no? The Holy Spirit did not permit us. The Holy Spirit is the one who's protecting them from danger. Oh, the gospel's going to be going that way. There's no doubt about it, but not yet. Okay? And here's the Holy Spirit exerting his will to protect and guide his people. And by the way, the Spirit's always in alignment with the Father, and we read through the Scripture, always in alignment with the Son. And so <clears throat> we want to know God's will. There's, you read the Bible, and he, you, know, you see the rules. This is how you're supposed to treat people. These are the, you know, the behavioral boundaries. Uh, you want to get along with your spouse? Do it the way the Bible says, and you're going to have a happier marriage, okay? Um, don't do it the way the Bible says, and you're going to be spending a lot of time on the forgiveness passages, okay? Um, interestingly enough, the Bible doesn't tell you who you're supposed to marry. I mean, there's some guidelines. They ought to be Christians because if they're not Christians, you're going to be unequally yoked, and that creates a whole bunch of negativity in your spiritual journey. All right? But there is the specific will of the Lord. Okay? And this is the voice of the Holy Spirit. And remember, in John 16, 13, he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak and will tell you the things to come. I got a couple of examples I think I shared with you already. I meet this beautiful woman on the beach. Lord, is this the one? And he says, no. Audibly, right in my ear, no. And so I dated her for two years. Okay? Um... I'm about to accept the job here. <clears throat> Actually, I got interviewed. The next day, I got on a flight to go to Rome to take a Mediterranean cruise for 17 days. And so I'm walking the promenade on the boat. That's the first opportunity I have to reflect on, you know, the interview at Celebration that I just had. And I said, Lord, because <clears throat> there was this moment in the interview where they go, yeah, you know, we, we got a, a great church family and we got these cool ministries and we're two million dollars in debt and we've got you know this staff and i'm like well, two, 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 two million dollars in debt you know and i so i make a joke with the lord i go lord I, when i said i wanted to go to a church with the two million dollar budget i meant in the black not the red okay i make a joke with the lord and he said to me i will raise the money verbally audibly spoke to me Okay, so, oh, I guess I'm going to celebration. When the Lord speaks to you, see, this time I followed his advice. I learned from the last time. And, and it's, it's amazing. This is what he does. He guides you into his specific will for you. You know, when the Old Testament is coming to an end, there's a 400-year period where it says there was no word from God. You know, all the prophets had words coming to them. No word to nobody. And interestingly, the Pharisees then, the religious leaders, created the most perfect moral application of the law that had ever been uh, devised. So without God, they came up with the law times ten. Okay? The problem is it didn't have the spirit of the law involved with the letter of the law. And so now Peter is introducing Jesus to everybody, and he quotes Joel, that young men are going to have dreams and women are going to have visions and everybody's going to be filled with the spirit of God and it's, uh, it's going to be an event, a changing, a history-changing event where Old Testament prophets used to hear from God, now everybody's going to hear from God. When it says you're going to prophesy, what that means is there's going to be a freshly spoken word from God through you to somebody. It does not contradict or add to what the Bible says. It's applying the word of God to people's specific lives, just to be clear on what prophecy is. Okay, it's not a fresh idea that isn't scriptural. It says people are going to have visions, how God wants to move in this world. We're going to have a vision on how God's going to move. Dreams, what God can accomplish if we allow him to move, okay? All this happens on the inside of us 
And who dwells on the inside of us? The Holy Spirit. What does it say in Joel? He's going to release his spirit on all flesh. All of us have access to the Spirit of God through Jesus Christ. Just need to be clear on that. It's through Jesus Christ. Well, <clears throat> interesting. You don't have to have a, a pastor or a priest be your intermarry intermediator anymore, okay? I know it's good to seek godly counsel. That's why I send people to talk to, uh, you know, Joe Gamichia and, and Carolyn, okay? Um, <clears throat> It's good to seek godly counsel, to consult the Word of God. But you know what? You don't need to. You can go right to the Lord and say, Lord, I, I need to know your will. I'm curious about what you want to see happen. One time, I wanted this job. I don't remember. I think it was a Hilton Head or something like that, you know. So I went into the sanctuary, and I wasn't going to leave until I twisted his arm to get the job. Okay? So I stayed in the sanctuary for five hours praying, making bargains, deals, promises, you know, beach life. I just feel really called to this Lord, you know, and the affluence of this community that I could use to, you know, build your kingdom. And I, and I had, I was working every angle, right? All of a sudden, about the fifth hour, this wall materializes in front of me. Oh, so what you're saying is I'm not going to Hilton Head. So I come home and I'm all excited. Michelle, I, the Lord spoke to me. What did he say? He said, we're not going. <laughs> and she was upset. Well, how come you're happy about this? Like, well, have you ever seen a wall? Okay. What happened there? I took the time to ask God and my motives were completely selfish. But I was in the presence of the Lord, asking the will of God, and he showed up. So I'm happy because I got to have an experience with God, which is more important than a destination, you know, because I wouldn't have been able to be with you guys right now, okay? Rather be here than there. And, and, and so here's what I want you to know. <clears throat> There's a moment when you're asking the will of God, you pray for it. You make the space for it. Sometimes I write out the pros and the cons. Sometimes people will come to me and say, Pastor, do you have a word for me? And it's a little bit awkward because, well, no. I don't know you. you know. And did you listen to the sermon? And Because maybe something will come out of the sermon, and that will be a word from God through me to you. And then I'll say, well, let's pray. And and I'll, and. I'll ask the Holy Spirit to give me a word and an impression will come to mind. And because you're in union with the Holy Spirit, sometimes the Spirit of God will give you an impression, a word, a picture for that person's life. Now, you have to be careful because it would be easy to just sit down and go, oh, Victoria, you know, I like Victoria. And so because I like Victoria, the possibility of something positive coming from my heart towards her is 100%. It's going to be real easy for me to misunderstand my will and my happiness for her rather than what God might be saying. Not that he would have anything negative to say. It's just that... You have to be careful that your happy feelings and your positive personality is separated from. Because I'll tell you this, a lot of times in my personal life, what I, want the whole, what I want to do is not what the Holy Spirit wants to do. He will guide me differently. I'll give an example. Somebody calls me 3.30 in the morning, Saturday night, actually Sunday morning, I'm sleeping, getting ready to preach. And they're upset and they're angry and they're attacking and accusing and saying all this negative stuff. And, you know, now my precious sleep before the sermon is, is going to be interrupted and you're not going to get the best sermon now. And I'm irritated because they have all this attitude. And so don't you usually meet attitude with attitude? Okay. Until the Holy Spirit comes in and says, is that an attitude I detect, William? Because this person is hurting right now. And I need you to not worry about your sleep. I can replace that. Your sermon's not about you anyways. 
It's about me flowing through you. What I'd like from you is to have the right heart towards this person who's obviously hurting. And so I turned attitude into prayer and slept like a baby till it was time to get up. See how the Holy Spirit intercepts and how the Holy Spirit operates? Okay. I'll tell you one more story. I only have three more minutes. I might go a little bit over. <clears throat> I make this friend like this guy. You know, he's the hip happening dude, and I was trying to be, and we were both Christians. And so <clears throat> um, I probably met him two times, and the Lord says, go to his house. I'm like, I'm not going to his house. I don't, we don't have that kind of relationship. And this is not when the soul, we didn't have cell phones back then, right? Go to his house. I'm like, no, nah, I'm going to go to the beach, Lord. I already had my beach bag planned. I was in the car. I was going to the beach and go to his house. Uh, you know, I don't have, you know, I, I kept arguing and then I'll go to his house. Okay. Go to his house. I go to knock on the door and as I hit the door, it opens. He's literally stepping off a chair to hang himself. Okay? Go to his house. Sometimes the Lord will tell you what to do. It has nothing to do with you. He wants to use you in somebody's life. And if you're in that relationship, if you're listening to him, if you're willing to be inconvenienced, if you're willing to do something that isn't social protocol, if you're willing and open to hearing and being directed, you could be in line with his desire to save a life, touch a life, impart his life to somebody else. And, and I'm going to tell you why it matters. I was referring to the Holy Spirit as a person, and the person has emotions. And we know this because the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and gentleness. All these things are emotions that we have, okay, characteristics. And this is the fruit of the Spirit. This is the personal attributes of the Holy Spirit. And, you know, you can grieve the Holy Spirit. And what is grief? It's the loss of intimacy. And so when you and I are not in tune with the Holy Spirit and we're doing our own thing, we move away from God. I don't believe we move away from our salvation. That's secure because of what Jesus did for you but we move out from that power that transforms us from broken to whole, from sinful to saint, from selfish to other focused. The desire to please myself suddenly becomes the, the, the goal to please God. That's what the Holy Spirit is doing inside of you. And when we don't stay aligned that way, we grieve the Spirit and we can shut his life down in us, in terms of that ongoing intimacy, that ability to hear, that prompting, okay? And so when you grieve and quench the Holy Spirit, you're missing out on the power, the presence, the amazing God that's been extended to you. So, last thought. There's a passage in Acts 8 where Philip preaches in Samaria <clears throat> and it says this, they called for Peter and John because they had simply believed in Jesus and had not yet received the Holy Spirit. You know, wait a minute. I thought the Holy Spirit enables you to believe in Jesus. That's right. And Paul, remember in Acts 19, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you first believed? For him, yeah, that's the way it works. Holy Spirit comes with Jesus. Peter's first sermon, you're going to be forgiven and given the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's part of your salvation. These guys have simply heard the message. They simply believe in what G God's love has done through Jesus Christ for them. And now the empowerment comes. And I guess I'm going to lay it out here for you. Are you ready to step in to the empowerment? You know, there's technical terms. The second baptism, 
You know, we can get all theological and, you know, but here's the deal. This is New Testament Christianity, and you and I live in the New Testament age, and we are following the Lord Jesus who gives us his Holy Spirit. This is not a history book about what used to happen. It's a manual, the living word that shows us how it's supposed to be, and how it's supposed to be is that you and I receive the Holy Spirit. Well, I already have the Holy Spirit. I know, because you believe in Jesus. He made that sure. But now you get to invite the Spirit further in to take over your thoughts, to drive you forward wherever you go, to clean up after you, to go before you, to communicate the presence, the love, the grace. All that God has made available comes to you through the Spirit of Jesus Christ. I'd like to invite you to just close your eyes. Love to have you lift your palms up. Lord Jesus, when you left, you were excited three different times. You breathed on the disciples in John 20, 22, and received the Holy Spirit. But you said, wait, because it's still coming. Power's going to come on you. And it came at Pentecost, and it has continued to be a gift that is available throughout Christian history. And right now, we want to receive your Spirit, scared that you might have a different agenda than ours, worried that we might not be worthy enough, You're right, we're not. You made us worthy. Excited that I could have more of God. And rather than shut you down because we're scared, with fear and trembling and excitement and and the spirit of adventure, we ask the Holy Spirit of Jesus Christ to come down now and fall upon every palm that's lifted up and move into our bodies and circulate within our souls and clean up our minds and heal our bodies. Release healing into Andrew right now. And let all of us step out of this chapter of our spiritual journey into a brand new one where the power and presence of the Holy Spirit is upon us. In Jesus' name, we receive his spirit. Amen. And amen. In today's fast-moving world, smartphones are integrated into our lives. We bank and shop on our smartphones, and many of us want to give with them too. Giving to the church with a text message is fast, easy, and versatile. With Give Plus Text, you can make a weekly offering or respond to a special appeal in just seconds. To give, you enter the church's 10-digit Give Plus Text number and the amount you wish to donate. Then, send your text. The first time you contribute with Give Plus Text, you'll receive a secure registration link. Click the link to go to our secure website where you'll enter your contact and payment information. Tap Process when you're done. After you've completed your registration, a text reply will verify that your gift has been received. We'll also email you a receipt. For future giving, you simply send a text with the amount you wish to give, and it will process automatically. You can also choose to make your gift recurring. Give Plus Text is that easy. Register, give, repeat. Call or visit the church office to ask about Give Plus Text and the other electronic giving options we offer.